Hello, everybody. How's it going? How's KubeCon day two? Make, I want to hear more because it sounds <laughs> good job. <laughs> awesome. Great. Um, I'm Priyanka Sharma, and I'm uh, your track host today. I'm director of technical evangelism at GitLab and also a member of the governing board of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is the CNCF who put together all of this event. Um, I'm also a member of the program committee, and CICD track was, one of, was the one that I was evaluating proposals for. And something that um, on the committee we all feel is that serverless is just growing like crazy. Uh, in my conversations with end users, I've definitely seen large enterprises that, uh, you know, some would consider very traditional, are already saying we're a serverless first engineering org, which is super cool. I think it's the cloud providers have so much cost savings with serverless that they pass them on and incentivize the end users to go that route as a, you know, as the first, uh, first step, kind of first thought step that you think of. So that's really interesting. Because of all this momentum, there's a lot of open source projects coming around, and um, Knative and cloud events are two such, uh, two such initiatives. So this particular talk is very interesting for me because uh, there'll be a live demo, and we'll see how cloud events and cloud uh, Knative eventing interacts, which I think will clarify a lot of confusions I have, and hopefully will be illuminating for you as well. And this talk is by. Ian Coffey, who is uh, in the engineering org in Salesforce. So Ian, please take it away. Oh, sorry, one quick thing. Don't forget to rate this session on SCED after we're done. It's really helpful for the program committee as we plan the next year. It's, it, we really would love it if you could do that. So now, Ian, please take it away. Great, yes, am I on here? Can you hear me? I think my mic, there we go. Hello, everybody. I am Ian. I'm super excited to talk to you about this topic. Uh, super excited that so many people are excited to listen and participate in this. I'm also excited that this room has magical properties. You can see that there's a maximum occupancy, over like 330. But above this door, if we're dancing, it goes to 650. So that's pretty dope. <laughs> so if we get in trouble, we got a backup plan. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Ian. As was mentioned, I live in upstate New York in a, co in a town called Troy. Uh, I work at Salesforce, and I hack on a platform called Heroku, which I think in this crowd would probably be pretty, pretty well known, 12-factor um, and the like. Uh, started my journey as a Linux systems administrator, and I think that's relevant. We'll come back to that in a little bit, but uh, I'm sure uh, there's more than a few people here that follow the same path. I think we're getting a little bit of feedback, but we'll press on. And um, lately, uh, a lot of my time uh, in the open source world has been sent uh, concentrating on uh, Tekton and Tekton triggers and things like that. Uh, that's kind of how I got interested in the cloud events and was introduced to these concepts. It's like trying to make all that work. Like how do you shuttle events from here to here to get into Tekton pipelines? So, uh, and also just thanks. Thanks for checking this out. Uh, wanted to take a second to have like a little bit of a meta discussion about like why this format? Why are we sitting here? Why are we spending opportunity costs together in this way, and I think uh, I've just noticed in my career, uh, year over year, I just tend to spend more time, I guess, developing what you'd consider learning materials. Maybe other people feel the same way that you know they can take many forms, maybe like getting started guides, lightning talks, brown bag demos, uh, all those sorts of things, informal learning materials, one-on-one -on -one mentoring sort of situations, and it comes up to me a lot. Like, how do you, how do you best spend that time? How how can we best make use of the time, whether it's synchronous like this or learning materials that are for like the open source community that you consume on your own time? It's still the same. Like, how do we spend the 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever is invested in it the best way? And how do we remove technical barriers for people to actually learn to use some of the tools that we have available to us now? Because they're not super useful if nobody's using them. Uh, interesting story, I think, that kind of ties into this is uh, I noticed for a long time the uh, Knative Eventing Project had a, a really cool readme called Writing Your Own Event Source. And it was two parts. The first part, you would uh, set up a CRD, you would like bootstrap your environment, you would bring up a cluster, you would do a whole bunch of stuff, and then part two didn't exist. So, so I mean, it's cool to have this technology, but it's cooler when we can all use it. Um, I tend to think that like slide-based demos are very difficult for relaying highly technical information, like fostering aha moments or like 
lightning bolt moments where like, you know, you just get it. Uh, I don't get that a lot from slide-based demos. Conversely, workshops, great. Like, really great, synchronous workshops. Everybody's working together. Everybody's helping each other to achieve some goal. But they don't scale, right? You can't do this many people in a synchronous setting. <laughs> Uh, and also, it's really hard. It's hard to prepare for workshops. It takes a lot of effort. You need teaching assistants. You need uh, a whole bunch of materials prepped. So it's, it's heavy. It reminds me of some experiences that I've had throughout my life that also fostered aha moments or like lightning bolt moments. And, and one of them, one of the clearest in my memory was uh, when I was a child, uh, my neighbor and best friend, his dad was a mechanic, and he had bought him a transparent internal combustion motor. And we were super into cars. Like, we wanted to understand everything about them. And, you know, we tried to understand them just from books and diagrams and things like that, looking under the hood of the car when it was running. But it was this moment where uh, having a motor running, this little tiny, you know, completely functional but see-through motor, and a mechanic, like, explaining, oh, this is what the cam's doing, this is what the lifters are doing. And it was like 10 seconds, and I've always remembered it. And that's when I understood what a moment was. And it kind of occurs to me, like, we can do that. We don't need to have, like, really crazy demos available to just foster that kind of learning environment. And I mentioned systems administration earlier. I did that because I feel like if you've ever worked in a data center supporting Linux servers, you have lots of these moments built in, right? Like, you might be working at a console, and then you go into the data center. Like, you might see XD3 errors at the console, but then you might actually see, like, the failing drive. Or you might get data from the IPMI module, or the NICs, or something like that. There's lots of different sources feeding you data about that running system. And I think that just is an underappreciated way to understand technology. I really, really feel like Kubernetes, in general, just gives us an awesome platform to develop those sorts of learning environments. Uh, and I'm talking about like self-contained environments, no configuration necessary. You're not going out and making infrastructure creds if you don't want to. You don't need to go do, set up a bunch of secrets. It's easy to stand them up. It takes low processing power. You learn what you need to learn, and then they're easily deletable. And we really have a great opportunity to kind of lean on that and not just build cool features, but kind of describe those features and get people inspired and get people interested in those technology. And that's kind of what we're doing today. Uh, we're going to take those ideas and we're going to try and build a cloud event and Knative based learning environment that's self-contained, is very low overhead, requires no configuration and you stand it up. There's some structured learning material and then you delete it when you're done. And I feel like if we can do that for this, we can do that for most or all of these projects and provide like a low barrier for folks to get uh, integrated with the projects, start contributing, building tools with them, stuff like that. But why include cloud events at all? I will completely admit that this entire demo could have been built exactly the same way without ever using cloud events. Um, it uh, would have taken a lot longer, but entirely possible. And I think the best way to describe why you know, the other reason to include cloud events is because it's in the name of the talk, but um, <laughs> connecting services is hard. If you can picture a few scenarios. Scenario one would be like a really easy scenario. You have team A and you have team B, and team A is going to de develop a service that's going to emit an event, and team B needs to consume it. Um, where do you start? Like, what are you gonna do? How, what do you, where do you even start having that conversation between the two teams about how you're going to emit the event, how you're going to receive the event, what's the format, the transport, how are you serializing it? Um, you know, and that's just if you're dealing with basic HTTP. If you're dealing with a whole bunch of other type of transports, it can get really complicated. And then you can take a step further back from that and like, what if it's not two teams working synchronously? What if one service already exists and was built three years ago? Uh, that becomes a much harder proposition. And then you can take a step back further from that, and what if you have some crazy scenario where you have a, a cluster in an academic research facility, and uh, some group has been given license to use that resource, so they want to admit an event, and they want to have it consumed by that facility? Like, how do you even start that conversation? There's no standardization, it's completely Wild West. Um, it's all about interoperability. It's a hard word to say, but it's, so important to start thinking about. Now that there's events flying everywhere, like we need to have some way 
to start in many situations describing data uh, in common formats. And at the end of the day, you get a lot of things out of it, but the number one thing from my perspective that you get from this common metadata on events is routing options. You can use this completely outside your apps to make intelligent decisions about who wants what event where. Um, and we can develop a pattern where services can subscribe themselves to the events that they need to consume to do their job. And in general, I just, I really do see quite a lot of questions, given the fact that Cloud Events is a very small little project, I think, in the grand scheme of things, more of a spec. Um, just a disproportionate amount of questions about it, and I think that's because, like, in a vacuum, it doesn't do anything. You know, it's, there's no, like, oh, well, get started, it's, it's a spec. It's kind of like I was thinking of parallels, and one would be, if you notice, there's very helpful people outside the store that have an ask me sign, but in a vacuum, nothing's gonna happen there. You need an actor to walk up and ask a question. You need to utilize it. So we can just take a minute here and talk about what a cloud event actually is. Uh, there's a 90 minute session tomorrow, I believe, that's gonna do a really deep dive on cloud events, current, future, past, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So this, that's not really the goal of this. We're gonna try and actually focus on just the parts that we need for this demo to keep our focus on that. And in that capacity, cloud events are just a spec that adds metadata to, uh, adds a common format of metadata so that we have things that we can rely on to make intelligent decisions for events. Um, and once we have that metadata established, sane routing can be happening. You know, we, we can make good decisions and we can remove a lot of app logic code at the same time. Because one pattern I see in developing, and which I will completely be honest drives me crazy, is services that ingest events and then have more or less a huge case switch statement that says like, you know, if this event has this little hint, like maybe it has a header here or it's in this little data format, you try and guess like what the event is and then you cast, you marshal it based off of that. And, it's all in this big case switch statement, it's ugly. And we don't have to do that. None of that stuff needs to exist. Um, we can get rid of that in its entirety and we'll show that in a minute. And I think another thing that we should mention is that Cloud Event's like a really cool name. Like it sounds like a really massive thing. But at the end of the day, the framework isn't really going to touch your logic or your business logic or how you're consuming these, these uh, events and what you're doing with them. Um, it's gonna serialize them you know, you're gonna transport them somewhere, but it's not going to make you rewrite all of your services if you chose to go this path. You'd have to modify the front end a little bit, but the business logic, no, not so much. The first four bold items here of the spec are required, and the rest are not. Uh, for cloud events, the spec version, 1.0 was released recently, I think about a month ago, which is really awesome. Um, the event type is a very important field. Uh, cloud events are a very low level uh, concept, so you can kind of adapt these how you need to, but I tend to think of the uh, cloud events type as a namespace. At least that's how it plays out when I write a system using cloud events and it feels like the right solution. It generally ends up that case. The source is pretty self-explanatory. It's good to know in a standard way where the event came from and every event gets a unique ID. There's some other things here. As a right, you can see there's an extensions, which is very, very useful. Uh, your app probably has like necessary fields and things that you need to route on that are very specific to your event types. And having extensions available to define that is really clutch. And then subject is a uh, newer addition to the spec, I believe, but it's also something that is really, really useful. In our demo, we're gonna use subject to kind of denote where the event's going and who should be consuming it, but again, these can all be adapted to the workload that you have. Going to try and breeze through the transports. Funny story was like, my first idea for this demo was to build a demo that made use of all the event sources. And if you can picture how crazy that would be, really happy that didn't happen. For this demo, we're gonna stick with HTTP, but there is a, just a world of advantage that there are people thinking about additional transports and that you can make use of these out of the box. Um, just in the name of interoperability, you know, how it's serialized, what the wire protocol is, these are really important things if you want things to be interoperable. There are some difficult parts, and I don't know if these are really classified as difficult parts. Again, the spec 
is low level. It doesn't really seem to make an attempt at solving these problems. But event ordering is something that comes up a lot when I talk about this. Like, how do I get these in a specific order? You're going to have to figure that out yourself, unfortunately. Um, replaying events. Like, you need events from 20 to 100. That's a really common thing to do, right? But that's not something that you're going to get out of the box. You're going to have to write some code there. And by getting new sources, that's not really a negative. It's just kind of reality. It's, it's reality. If, if you have this service that emits events, and you want to consume it in your cluster in this fashion, it's probably not going to be emitted as a cloud event from where it's coming from. You're probably going to have to do some adapting. And that's reality, that's just life, but it is something that you have to think about when you're doing this. How are they eventing up in a, in a cloud event format um, in the first place? And there are many SDKs available, and they're wonderful, they're wonderful to work with, and a wonderful advantage to be able to say, like we said earlier, you have a team A and a team B. Okay, well, what if team A is Go and team B is Java? Having like that commonality to say, we're speaking on the same terms, we're using the same verbs and words here to describe our event format across these different languages can be just a really big time saver. Who wants to reinvent things over and over again? I mean, when we start new businesses, do we start writing new kernels from scratch? No, we just use Linux, because what value is there to reinventing this stuff? I don't know if there's a lot of value in reinventing a lot of the things in cloud events in some uh, circumstances. So it's nice that we can just say, okay, for most of the languages that we have, we have a baseline of support that we know that we can use. So we can sum up and at the end of the day, cloud eventing just gives you some base metadata that you attach to events that you can use to do some intelligent things with that message, with that event, based on what it is, based on what it declares itself to be. Um, not what you guessed it is, not what you inferred by like checking certain parts of the data envelope. Uh, the language's SDK, SDK is just really, really nice to have when most companies are not just writing in one language. You know, it's great to have that just out of the way that here are the languages that we can support and here's the libraries and let's get going. Let's start writing code. From there, Knative Eventing we're gonna talk about is gonna pick up the ball. Because like I said, cloud events in isolation don't really do anything. So we need something to use them with and we're gonna use it with Knative Eventing and we're gonna use it to route services based on the data in the event. And then at the last, we're gonna rip all that awful out routing code out of the apps, all those case switch statements, and all of that you know, event detection, and all detecting different fields, we don't need to do it. We don't have to. In fact, we can just slim down apps a lot, and I, this is probably the number one reason why I'm standing here and why I use cloud events is that uh, standing up services just in this particular capacity is pretty quick and easy. What kind of use cases do fit this pattern we just talked about. I think we've talked about CI and CD, this KubeCon, more than I could have ever dreamed. It's just like, seems to be like white hot. But like, what about a simpler process? What about cron based? Like, let's say you, you have a Kubernetes cron every day at noon to make you a sandwich. Like, you're hungry at noon, you need a sandwich. So you need to emit an event to your sandwich robot. And, you know, to be able to do that, the sandwich robot doesn't need to care about all of these other things. It just needs to care like, I just got an event, I know what I need to do. And maybe, maybe it's a turkey sandwich. So you could set your subject to turkey. So the turkey sandwich robot is always going to get your message. And it doesn't need to care about everything that came before. It just needs to know I need to make a turkey sandwich and bring it to Ian. And eventing is the other half of this project here. I'm going to really try and drill down on these three concepts. It's a big concept, it's a big project, but brokers, triggers, and container sources are what we're going to experiment with. I'm gonna try and breeze through this because I'm going pretty slow. But brokers are a newish project. I think 05 was released newish, maybe within the last six months. But brokers are really cool because they just act as a black box, as an event mesh between where your events are being ingested and where they end up. And we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it really just feels like cheap and easy multiplexing. So you receive an event here, and n number of things care about it. And the first half doesn't have to know about the second half. You know, you subscribe to the things you're interested in. You're not just trying to say, I know this thing needs it. The app sending it shouldn't care. It's just emitting an event. Just to give a quick detail on the broker details, what brokers consisted of, mainly there's two pods and two channels. Uh, these are actually should be reversed. The ingress 
logically would come first. And the ingress pod is just going to actually accept events, place it on the ingress channel after doing some inspection. The filter pod is going to check that or pick those up. It's going to say, okay, I have all of these Knative triggers defined, and these ones match this filter, so they're all getting a message. At that point, it's going to be put on the trigger channel, and all of those services are listening on that channel, and they're going to receive a copy of the message. Knative triggers, as I just mentioned, is the other part of this process that's very important, and triggers acts as the way that we define the subscriptions. In other words, that's a way for an app to say, I'm interested in this. this, this is, these are events that I need to get. And when you define a, a trigger, you can either just define a trigger which ingests all events from a broker, or more likely, you're gonna filter. You're gonna filter based on what's necessary for that service to be interested in it. Like, it has to be a sandwich event, and it has to be of type turkey. Here's an event, or excuse me, an example trigger filter. And you can see in this one, there's no broker defined, so this will end up on the broker that's the default. And under the filter in the spec, we're looking for all events that have a subject of Dave defined, and of this extension as value. And if it matches that, the uh, filter pod that we just mentioned before is going to put it on the trigger channel. It's gonna end up at Radical Service 2000, and from there you're off and running. Your event can then be processed. So we're going to jump uh, into demos. And this demo is, I didn't want to do something that represented a system that existed in real life. I felt like it would give a better cross-section to what's happening to just dream up something entirely different and more fun. So we're gonna build a tiny distributed system and it has little AI actors. These actors are just pods and they're gonna have a conversation. Um, it's ridiculous and, and I have no idea what they're going to say, but that's the point. And, but the interesting, or the most important thing to pay attention to is that these actors are not outputting what they say like I am. Um, they're outputting what they hear. Um, so they're not, it would be very easy for a pod to just boot up and say like, okay, uh, format.println say something, and we would see those lines. No, this is only saying we're speaking in cloud events, and when I receive something, I'm going to make a note of the messages I received. So that everything we're seeing here are successful round trips of events. There's many parallels between, and the reason I use the conversation is because I feel like there's a lot of like direct correlation between the system we're building, events, and conversations. And here's some of them, like cloud events are indicative of the messages we're sending, or like the sentences, or paragraphs, or ideas. Uh, the broker is going to represent the conversation, or maybe you could say the room, like this room. Um, triggers, yeah, we don't really have a concept for this in conversations, but it's, it signifies interest in a topic and the pods are actors, and the container source is the act of speaking. It's open your mouth and letting words come out is what the container source is going to represent. So we're gonna start the system now. <laughs> and it's tiny. Um, and what we're doing right now is we're just running an upscript. And what the upscript is doing, I mentioned earlier, self-contained environments, things that are very simple to get involved in, to get started with. Um, that's what we're doing right here. From bin up, we're gonna create an entire Kubernetes cluster with Kind, which is awesome, development tool that I would strongly recommend if you do a lot of local development, Kind is just awesome to use. And we're gonna create an entire Kubernetes cluster with that. Following that, we're gonna use Glue, which is another really awesome project to uh, initialize Knative on our cluster. And then finally, we're going to install three resources that are just gonna set the stage for our conversation. So let's check out one of those which uh, I obviously cannot remember the name of. And this is a broker. That's all we're defining here. And in this broker, we're saying uh, the name is conversation broker, which is not a great name for a broker because broker is prepend broker. So this is conversation broker broker. And all we're saying is this is an in-memory channel. And it's living in the namespace work conversation where everything will live and when you're done with it, just delete the namespace and you're done. Um, Quickly, we should probably check out what's going on. Kale is another great tool. Kale will just aggregate all the pod logs from your namespace. So if you're like troubleshooting something, you don't wanna like waste time, especially if it's urgent, figuring out what's going on. As you can see, there's nothing going on in our namespace right now. Traffic is very low. 
but we can fix that. We're going to add some actors. Um, and we should add an actor named Tracy. Uh, we'll add an actor named Fred. Uh, I think Jane wants to join the conversation. And how about Peter? Um, and so this is going to take a few minutes. Uh, internal DNS is going to take like a minute or two to settle. So let's take a minute and we'll check out a diagram about what's happening right now. And what's happening right now, if you start at the top left and go counterclockwise, we created a pod named Tracy. And uh, Tracy booted up and she sent a container, she sent an event or a cloud event via Knative container source that you can see in the bottom left. Uh, this event is of type message, com, Ian Coffee, conversation message is the event type. And in the bottom left, we can also see that the subject is to all. This message is meant for everyone in the conversation. And the source was Tracy. Tracy spoke this message. And on the right, you can see Fred exists. And Fred is subscribed to all messages. Fred cares to get all these messages. We didn't have any other config. We can create as many actors as we want. We can name them anything they want. They're just going to discuss amongst themselves. And there's no configuration file anywhere. Um, we're just signifying the relationship between the sender and the recipients via their interest in that particular message type. So let's take a minute here and jump back over to our demo and check out what it looks like. First, let's see how that traffic's looking now. That looks much more like a distributed system, right? Lots going on here. But let's drill into the conversation itself. And you can see. They're having this really strange conversation amongst themselves. And it's ridiculous. They, they say things in response to each other. And you might notice that there's duplicates. But there's not actually duplicates. Because if you think about it, they're outputting what they're hearing. And right now, if we had the same thing going on here, I'm speaking to everyone here. And if you all were putting uh, what you were hearing to standard out, there'd be a whole lot of duplication. And that's all you're seeing here is these are messages to everyone. And when it's to everyone, everyone notes that that's what Jane said. But we can drill even further. I mentioned earlier uh, one really pivotal moment for me with learning how internal combustion motors work was seeing inside, like seeing how it worked. And we can do the same thing here. This is the wire protocol of what's going on. Um, lots and lots of cloud events flowing around the system. And this is what's happening. This is all that's happening. We're just sending, sending cloud events around between these actors in this little tiny distributed system so that they can have this conversation. And let's capture one of these. Here's a good one. You notice here the spec version's 0.03. It's actually being sent as 1.0. I opened a pull request to fix this, but I think that the broker downgrades all cloud events to 0.03 right now. So just something to note. Um, the type, of course, is conversation message. And this message was from Peter to Fred. And he said, that's just rude. And that's pretty much what it looks like on the wire. But what is happening in our namespace? Like, what, what is really the, the resource situation here? And as you can see, there's a lot going on in here. All of these container sources at the bottom here represent one message that someone's saying. And after they say it, these actors are very nice. They clean up after themselves. They do automatic garbage collection. But um, they are constantly just sending these container source messages. And you can see above here, the reason they're being received is that we have these subscriptions. And these are all of the combinations of subscriptions that we care about. So uh, Peter cares about all messages. Uh, Tracy wants messages just to Tracy, things like that. So we're defining those right here. But I think we can take this a little bit further. What if we wanted to send a new event type? It's a really common thing, right? You have a service. Now it needs to ingest a different kind of service type or event type. Like, how would we do that? Well, let's try that with a new event type called distracted. We're going to distract our actors. One little secret about them is they're very easily distracted. It's just like normal people. So we're going to uh, set up the ability for them to ingest this new event type, and then we're going to send them one. Let's check out what that looks like, though. In this file, you can see a whole new set of triggers. This bottom one here is noting that Peter should now become interested in the distracted um, event type. And any messages sent to all that have the type of distracted, once we apply this file, 
Um, Peter is going to become interested in those. He's going to become, he's going to signal to the system, hey, I want to receive these messages now. So let's just apply these real quick. And voila. Now, when we send this uh, new event type, instead of it just going into the broker and hanging out forever and timing out and being dropped, now it'll end up being delivered. Um, and we're going to deliver our new um, event type with magic wand. And all magic wand is a fancy little script which acts as a template for sending yet another container source event type. So all we're doing is creating a container source, the container source boots, and it's going to send a cloud event wherever we tell it to. In this case, it's going to set the type to distracted, and it's going to send it to everyone. So let's, let's try it out. And right away, we're going to want to see how this affects them, right? We said they're easily distracted. What does that look like? Um, so let's do that. So we've sent it. It's going to be sent to all since we didn't specify anyone. And you can see, oh, they got interested in something. So now every single one of those actors has now received this distracted event. So you can see that their behaviors changed entirely. They don't care about anything else anymore. And the only reason they received this event is because of that triggers file we just created. If we hadn't, none of them would receive this, we wouldn't have seen any change in their behavior. Well, what else can we do? Like, what, what other sorts of things can you do with this uh, sort of setup? I mean, this is one of the things I usually referred to in the past as the dream. But it, it's a really complex pipeline, but it's just very powerful. And if you start at the top left, just starting from a git push, um, we're going to create an event. It doesn't really matter where it's coming from, what git service, whatever. But as long as it can be, make it to our Knative cluster, it can be received by serving. The Knative eventing adapter will then uh, create a, uh, or modify it to become a cloud event. The cloud event will end up in our broker. Moving up the middle line, we can have a Tekton trigger, like we mentioned Igert, uh, earlier. And we're only going to subscribe the trigger to things that it's interested in. So the trigger can be completely dumb. It does not need to know anything about the types or the formats of things it's getting. We're handing that all upstream. And the trigger is going to receive that message. And it's going to create a Tekton pipeline. And the Tekton pipeline is going to do its awesome magic. Tekton's awesome. And we're going to get uh, the pipeline started to create all of the things on the right, go test that building Docker image, pushing, all of these sorts of things. And we really have that round trip nailed down. And if we want to upgrade, let's say we have another system, but we don't have to like replace or modify the other system. We just stand it up and we subscribe it to the different message types that we're interested in. And we can kind of keep doing this pattern uh, into infinity. And that's pretty much the entirety of the talk here. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. I think we have two minutes, but uh, I'm not sure if there are any questions. Any questions? I must have did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right. Well, thank you so much.